Thomas Hardy Thomas Hardy was an English novelist and poet. A Victorian realist in the tradition of George Eliot, he was influenced both in his novels and in his poetry by Romanticism, especially William Wordsworth. He was highly critical of much in Victorian society, especially on the declining status of rural people in Britain, such as those from his native southwest England. While Hardy wrote poetry throughout his life and regarded himself primarily as a poet, his first collection was not published until 1898. Initially, therefore, he gained fame as the author of such novels as Far from the Madding Crowd, The Mayor of Casterbridge, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, and Jude the Obscure. During his lifetime, Hardy's poetry was acclaimed by younger poets who viewed him as a mentor. After his death, his poems were lauded by Ezra Pound, W. H. Auden, and Philip Larkin. Many of his novels concern tragic characters struggling against their passions and social circumstances, and they are often set in the semi-fictional region of Wessex, initially based on the medieval Anglo-Saxon kingdom, Hardy's Wessex eventually came to include the counties of Dorset, Wiltshire, Somerset, Devon, Hampshire and much of Berkshire, in southwest and south-central England. Two of his novels, Tess of the D'Urbervilles and Far from the Madding Crowd, were listed in the top 50 on the BBC's Survey the Big Red. Thomas Hardy was born on June 2, 1840 in Hirebach Hampton, a hamlet in the parish of Stinsford to the east of Dorchester in Dorset, England, where his father Thomas worked as a stonemason and local builder, and married his mother Jemima in Beminster, towards the end of 1839. Jemima was well read, and she educated Thomas until he went to his first school at Buckhampton at the age of eight. For several years he attended Mr. Last's Academy for Young Gentlemen in Dorchester where he learned Latin and demonstrated academic potential. Because Hardy's family lacked the means for a university education, his formal education ended at the age of 16, when he became apprentice to James Hicks, a local architect. Hardy trained as an architect in Dorchester before moving to London in 1862, there he enrolled as a student at King's College London. He won prizes from the Royal Institute of British Architects and the Architectural Association. He joined Arthur Blomfield's practice as assistant architect in April 1862 and worked with Blomfield on All Saints Parish Church in Windsor, Berkshire in 1862-64. A rare DAS, possibly designed by Hardy, was discovered behind paneling at All Saints in August 2016. In the mid-1860s, Hardy was in charge of the excavation of part of the graveyard of St. Pancras Old Church prior to its destruction when the Midland Railway was extended to a new terminus at St. Pancras. Hardy never felt at home in London, because he was acutely conscious of class divisions and his social inferiority. During this time he became interested in social reform and the works of John Stuart Mill. He was also introduced by his Dorset friend Horace Moule to the works of Charles Fourier and Auguste Comte. After five years, concerned about his health, he returned to Dorset, settling in Weymouth, and decided to dedicate himself to writing. In 1870, while on an architectural mission to restore the parish church of St. Juliet in Cornwall, Hardy met and fell in love with Emma Gifford, whom he married in Kensington in the autumn of 1874. Renting St. David's Villa, Southborough for a year. In 1885, Thomas and his wife moved into Maxgate, a house designed by Hardy and built by his brother. Although they later became estranged, Emma's subsequent death in 1912 had a traumatic effect on him, and after her death, Hardy made a trip to Cornwall to revisit places linked with their courtship, his poems 1912-13 reflect upon her death. In 1914, Hardy married his secretary Florence Emily Dugdale, who was 39 years his junior. However, he remained preoccupied with his first wife's death and tried to overcome his remorse by writing poetry. In his later years, he kept a dog named Wessex, who was notoriously ill-tempered. Wessex's gravestone can be found on the Maxgate grounds. In 1910, Hardy had been appointed a member of the Order of Merit and was also for the first time nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. He would be nominated again for the prize 11 years later. Hardy became ill with pleurisy in December 1927 and died at Maxgate just after 9 p.m. on January 11, 1928, having dictated his final poem to his wife on his deathbed. The cause of death was cited, on his death certificate, as cardiac syncope with old age given as a contributory factor. His funeral was on 16th of January at Westminster Abbey, and it proved a controversial occasion because Hardy had wished for his body to be interred at Stinsford in the same grave as his first wife, Emma. His family and friends concurred, however, his executor, Sir Sidney Carlyle Cockerell, 
insisted that he be placed in Fabius' famous poet's corner. A compromise was reached whereby his heart was buried at Stinsford with Emma, and his ashes in Poet's Corner. Hardy's estate at death was valued at £95,418. Shortly after Hardy's death, the executors of his estate burnt his letters and notebooks, but twelve notebooks survived, one of them containing notes and extracts off newspaper stories from the 1820s, and research into these has provided insight into how Hardy used them in his works. In the year of his death, Mrs. Hardy published The Early Life of Thomas Hardy, 1841 to 1891, compiled largely from contemporary notes, letters, diaries, and biographical memoranda, as well as from oral information and conversations extending over many years. Hardy's work was admired by many younger writers, including D. H. Lawrence, John Cooper Powis, and Virginia Woolf. In his autobiography Goodbye to All That, Robert Graves recalls meeting Hardy in Dorset in the early 1920s and how Hardy received him and his new wife warmly, and was encouraging about his work. Hardy's birthplace in Bockhampton and his house Maxgate, both in Dorchester, are owned by the National Trust. Hardy's first novel, The Poor Man and the Lady, finished by 1867, failed to find a publisher. He then showed it to his mentor and friend, the Victorian poet and novelist, George Meredith, who felt that the poor man and the lady would be too politically controversial and might damage Hardy's ability to publish in the future. So Hardy followed his advice and he did not try further to publish it. He subsequently destroyed the manuscript, but used some of the ideas in his later work. After he abandoned his first novel, Hardy wrote two new ones that he hoped would have more commercial appeal, Desperate Remedies and Under the Greenwood Tree, both of which were published anonymously. It was while working on the latter that he met Emma Gifford, who would become his wife. In 1873 A Pair of Blue Eyes, a novel drawing on Hardy's courtship of Emma, was published under his own name. The term cliffhanger is considered to have originated with the serialized version of this story in which Henry Knight, one of the protagonists, is left literally hanging off a cliff. In his next novel Far From the Matting Crowd, Hardy first introduced the idea of calling the region in the west of England, where his novels are set, Wessex. Wessex had been the name of an early Saxon kingdom, in approximately the same part of England. Far From the Matting Crowd was successful enough for Hardy to give up architectural work and pursue a literary career. Over the next 25 years Hardy produced 10 more novels. Subsequently, the Hardys moved from London to Yeovil, and then to Sturminster Newton where he wrote The Return of the Native. Hardy published Two on a Tower in 1882, a romance story set in the world of astronomy. Then in 1885, they moved for the last time, to Max Gate, a house outside Dorchester designed by Hardy and built by his brother. There he wrote The Mayor of Casterbridge, The Woodlanders, and Tess of the D'Urbervilles, the last of which attracted criticism for its sympathetic portrayal of a fallen woman and was initially refused publication. Its subtitle, A Pure Woman faithfully presented, was intended to raise the eyebrows of the Victorian middle classes. Jude the Obscure, published in 1895, met with an even stronger negative response from the Victorian public because of its controversial treatment of sex, religion and marriage. Furthermore, its apparent attack on the institution of marriage caused further strain on Hardy's already difficult marriage because Emma Hardy was concerned that Jude the Obscure would be read as autobiographical. Some booksellers sold the novel in brown paper bags, and the Bishop of Wakefield, Walsham Howe, is reputed to have burnt his copy. In his postscript of 1912, Hardy humorously referred to this incident as part of career of the book. After these, hostile, verdicts from the press its next misfortune was to be burned by a bishop, probably in his despair at not being able to burn me. Despite this, Hardy had become a celebrity by the 1900s but some argue that he gave up writing novels because of the criticism of both Tess of the D'Urbervilles and Jude the Obscure. The well-beloved, first serialized in 1892, was published in 1897. Considered a Victorian realist, Hardy examines the social constraints on the lives of those living in Victorian England, and criticizes those beliefs, especially those relating to marriage, education and religion, that limited people's lives and caused unhappiness. Such unhappiness, and the suffering it brings, is seen by poet Philip Larkin as central in Hardy's works. In Two on a Tower, for example, Hardy takes a stand against these rules of society with a story of love that crosses the boundaries of class. The reader is forced to reconsider the conventions set up by society for the relationships between women and men. Nineteenth-century society had conventions, which were enforced. 
In this novel Swithin St. Cleve's idealism pits him against such contemporary social constraints. Fate or chance is another important theme. Hardy's characters often encounter crossroads on a journey, a junction that offers alternative physical destinations but which is also symbolic of a point of opportunity and transition, further suggesting that fate is at work. Far from the Madding Crowd is an example of a novel in which chance has a major role, had Bathsheba not sent the Valentine, had Fanny not missed her wedding, for example, the story would have taken an entirely different path. Indeed, Hardy's main characters often seem to be held in fate's overwhelming grip. For online poems, see Poetry Collections below. In 1898 Hardy published his first volume of poetry, Wessex Poems, a collection of poems written over 30 years. While some suggest that Hardy gave up writing novels following the harsh criticism of Jude the Obscure in 1896, the poet C. H. Sisson calls this hypothesis superficial and absurd. In the 20th century Hardy published only poetry. Thomas Hardy wrote in a great variety of poetic forms including lyrics, ballads, satire, dramatic monologues, and dialogue, as well as the three-volume epic closet drama The Dynasts, and though in some ways a very traditional poet, because he was influenced by folk song and ballads, he was never conventional, and persistently experimented, with different, often invented, stanza forms and meters, and made use of rough-hewn rhythms and colloquial diction. Hardy wrote a number of significant war poems that relate to both the Boer Wars and World War I, including Drummer Hodge, In Time of the Breaking of Nations, and The Man He Killed. His work had a profound influence on other war poets such as Rupert Brooke and Siegfried Sassoon. Hardy in these poems often used the viewpoint of ordinary soldiers and their colloquial speech. A theme in the Wessex poems is the long shadow that the Napoleonic Wars cast over the 19th century, as seen, for example, in the Sargent Song in Leipzig. The Napoleonic War is the subject of the dynasts. Some of Hardy's most famous poems are from poems of 1912-13, part of satires of circumstance, written following the death of his wife Emma in 1912. They had been estranged for 20 years and these lyric poems express deeply felt regret and remorse. Poems like After a Journey, The Voice, and others from this collection are by general consent regarded as the peak of his poetic achievement. In a recent biography on Hardy, Claire Tomlin argues that Hardy became a truly great English poet after the death of his first wife, Emma, beginning with these elegies, which he describes as among the finest and strangest celebrations of the dead in English poetry. Many of Hardy's poems deal with themes of disappointment in love and life, and the perversity of fate, but the best of them present these themes with a carefully controlled elegiac feeling. Irony is also an important element in a number of Hardy's poems, including The Man He Killed and Are You Digging on My Grave? A few of Hardy's poems, such as The Blinded Bird, a melancholy polemic against the sport of, reflect his firm stance against animal cruelty, exhibited also in his anti-vivisectionist views and his membership in the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. A number of notable English composers, including Gerald Finzi, Benjamin Britten, and Gustav Holst, set poems by Hardy to music. Holst also wrote the orchestral tone poem Aiden Heath a homage to Thomas Hardy in 1927. Although his poems were initially not as well received as his novels had been, Hardy is now recognized as one of the greatest 20th century poets, and his verse has had a profound influence on later writers, including Robert Frost, W. H. Auden, Dylan Thomas, and, most notably Philip Larkin. Larkin included 27 poems by Hardy compared with only 9 by T.S. Eliot in his edition of the Oxford Book of 20th Century English Verse in 1973. There were also fewer poems by W.B. Yeats. Hardy's family was Anglican, but not especially devout. He was baptized at the age of five weeks and attended church, where his father and uncle contributed to music. However, he did not attend the local Church of England school instead being sent to Mr. Last School, three miles away. As a young adult, he befriended Henry R. Bastow, who also worked as a pupil architect, and who was preparing for adult baptism in the Baptist Church. Hardy flirted with conversion, but decided against it. Bastow went to Australia and maintained a long correspondence with Hardy, but eventually Hardy tired of these exchanges and the correspondence ceased. This concluded Hardy's links with the Baptists. The Irony and Struggles of Life coupled with his naturally curious mind, led him to question the traditional Christian view of God. Scholars have debated Hardy's religious leanings for years, often unable to reach a consensus. However, Hardy's religious life seems to have mixed agnosticism, deism, 
and Spiritism. Once, when asked in correspondence by a clergyman, Dr. A.B. Grossert, about the question of reconciling the horrors of human and animal life with the absolute goodness and non-limitation of God, Hardy replied, Hardy frequently conceived of, and wrote about, supernatural forces, particularly those that control the universe through indifference or caprice, a force he called the imminent will. He also showed in his writing some degree of fascination with ghosts and spirits. Even so, he retained a strong emotional attachment to the Christian liturgy and church rituals, particularly as manifested in rural communities, that had been such a formative influence in his early years, and biblical references can be found woven throughout many of Hardy's novels. Hardy's friends during his apprenticeship to John Hicks included Horace Mule and the poet William Barnes, both ministers of religion. Moore remained a close friend of Hardy's for the rest of his life, and introduced him to new scientific findings that cast doubt on literal interpretations of the Bible, such as those of Gideon Mantell. Moore gave Hardy a copy of Mantell's book The Wonders of Geology in 1858, and Adeline Buckland has suggested that there are compelling similarities between the cliffhanger section from A Pair of Blue Eyes and Mantell's geological descriptions. It has also been suggested that the character of Henry Knight in A Pair of Blue Eyes was based on Horace Moore. Sites associated with Hardy's own life and which inspired the settings of his novels continued to attract literary tourists and casual visitors. For locations in Hardy's novels, see Thomas Hardy's Wessex and the Thomas Hardy's Wessex research site, which includes maps. Hardy corresponded with and visited Lady Catherine Milnes Gaskell at Wenlock Abbey, and many of Lady Catherine's books are inspired by Hardy, who was very fond of her. D. H. Lawrence's study of Thomas Hardy indicates the importance of Hardy for him, even though this work is a platform for Lawrence's own developing philosophy rather than a more standard literary study. The influence of Hardy's treatment of character, and Lawrence's own response to the central metaphysic behind many of Hardy's novels, helped significantly in the development of the rainbow and women in love. Wood and Stone, the first novel by John Cooper Powys who was a contemporary of Lawrence, was dedicated with devoted admiration to the greatest poet and novelist of our age Thomas Hardy. Powys's later novel Maiden Castle is set in Dorchester, Hardy's Casterbridge, and was intended by Powys to be a rival to Hardy's The Mayor of Casterbridge. Maiden Castle is the last of Powys's so-called Wessex novels, Wolf Solent, a Glastonbury romance, and Weymouth Sands, which are set in Somerset and Dorset. Hardy was clearly the starting point for the character of the novelist Edward Driffield in W. Somerset Mom's novel Cakes and Ale. Thomas Hardy's works also feature prominently in the American playwright Christopher Durang's The Marriage of Bed and Boo, in which a graduate thesis analyzing Tess of the D'Urbervilles is interspersed with analysis of Matt's family's neuroses. Hardy has been a significant influence on Nigel Blackwell frontman of the post-punk British rock band Half Man Half Biscuit, who has often incorporated phrases by or about Hardy, into his song lyrics. Hardy divided his novels and collected short stories into three classes. Novels of character and environment, romances and fantasies, novels of ingenuity. Hardy also produced a number of minor tales, one story. The Spectre of the Real was written in collaboration with Florence Henniker. An additional short story collection, beyond the ones mentioned above, is A Changed Man in Other Tales. His works have been collected as the 24 volume Wessex edition and the 37 volume Melstock edition. His largely self written biography appears under his second wife's name in two volumes from 1928 to 1930, as The Early Life of Thomas Hardy, 1840 91, and The Later Years of Thomas Hardy. 1892 to 1928, now published in a critical one-volume edition as The Life and Work of Thomas Hardy, edited by Michael Milgate. Short stories, online poems, poems by Thomas Hardy at Poetry Foundation and poems by Thomas Hardy at poemhunter.com. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.